Hello, and welcome to our third virtual artist studio tour. Today, we're featuring one of our Women to Watch 2020 artists, Sofia Cordova. Unfortunately, last September, Sofia could not join us at our Women to Watch exhibition because fortunately, she was having a beautiful baby. So oh. and we really haven't had a chance to meet her until now. So welcome and thank you, Sophia, for agreeing to meet all of us via Zoom and for showing us around your studio. We look forward to hearing more about you and your art concepts. And we're also eager to see which pieces you have available for purchases as well. So being the third Zoom call, I think you all know the drill by now. But as a reminder, Jamie Austin of CCA will be moderating the Zoom call. And then at the end of the studio visit, I'll be pop popping back on to see if anyone has any questions. So again, thank you to Sophia, Jamie, and Lorna for all your support and educating our advocacy group. And if Eileen is there, I'm gonna give you a wave. Um, I hope she comes back on or comes on because I'd love for her to talk about the Woman to Watch 2023 theme. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, I'll give it to Jamie and Sophia. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Jamie Austin, Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at CCA and honorable or, um, honorary member of this NIMWA group. And I'm so happy to be here today with all of you for another virtual studio visit. Um, I would also like to thank and recognize the artists who we have on this call. I see Julia and Amy and Catherine and Lava. And certainly we're all here to support Sophia today. So it's lovely for all of you to come out in community and to see the rest of um, the members of this group. Um, it really warms my heart. And these are some of my favorite moments of the week when we get to do these studio visits. Um, today, I'm happy to be introducing artist Sophia Cordova. Many of you didn't have the chance to meet Sophia, like Robin mentioned during the Servicing Histories exhibition at the galleries, but she was there in spirit and she was there for install, which was lovely. And I'm happy that we have the chance to learn more about her multidisciplinary work today, because even though that NIMWA exhibition was focused on the medium of paper, Sophia is probably best known for her digital work, which includes video, installation, music, photography, and performance. And she's gonna share all of those with us today. Sophia was born in Puerto Rico. She received her MFA from CCA in 2010, and she's currently based in the East Bay and is represented by Kate Warble Gallery in New York. And she'll be showing us a few things that are available there, as well as work that she has um, in her own gallery. So please join me in welcoming Sophia, who will share more of her studio practice with us. Am I on mute? Hi all, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, it's really um, so nice to meet you even in this sort of weird mediated screen way um, after a whole kind of year of knowing about your good works. And again, I wanna thank you all for, for your support through the exhibition and um, everything that's kind of happened since. Um, so like, uh, oh, a few things. Um, I do work in a variety of media, as Jamie said. So I will be touching kind of very generally on sort of the core themes of the practice. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to throw them in the chat or raise your hand um, or save them to the end as you wish. But, you know, know that I'm kind of gliding through a lot of themes. So if there's anything that you want to go deeper on, I'm always here for that. And then um, as Robin mentioned, um, or Jamie, sorry, the works for sale bit, um, everything more or less is exists in some edition form or another that you're going to see today. Um, and I will specifically talk about the end about a subscription series that the gallery I work with is doing. But if anything, if you have any questions in that regard as well, um, I'm happy to answer them. Sorry that I have these glasses that like just have you in them, um, but let's, let's, get, let's get on with the show. Oh, I will be showing some video um, so just know that, you know, on your end, I will try to control the volume, but you might have to do a little, little sound work on your end. Um, everything that looks good on your end? Okay. So I wanted to briefly, briefly start with what was my first engagement with art making. And um, believe it or not, my first 
work, the thing that I'm trained in that I'm educated in is photography. Um, and portraiture kind of held a very important place in my heart for a really long time because I feel like in a very basic way, it was a way that I could interface with people and the world. And I felt like even though I worked primarily in documentary, um, I was engaging in this sort of practice of storytelling, even in that sort of hard space of hard fact. Um, and so for a long time, my work was really centered on these documentary style images that always left the question, a door open to interpretation beyond what was in the image. Um, over time, that felt like it wasn't enough. And um, after going to graduate school and sitting with a great deal of theory for a long time, I started thinking that, you know, that 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 was that instinct was correct. I wasn't quite where I needed to be with the work. And so I started really pushing this element of fantasy and storytelling and really kind of asking the questions um, that are so prevalent in the world of photography is image making truly this kind of objective work or is it always kind of up to the artist what stories are being told and so who better than my own family to um, ask those questions with so I started doing this sort of large format tableau work um, that you know these images are created with four by five cameras the resolution is like beyond it's film photography it's it's all very meticulous work um, and so that was really satisfactory for a while, but over time, the kind of rigor of it felt like it wasn't, I wasn't loose enough within the work. And so what I started thinking about was, well, what am I really after? What am I really, what this idea of, of fantasy and, and fiction and documentary, what's it after? And what I really realized was that I was kind of scratching at the question of representation, you know, and this is a question that I think is very prevalent in our contemporary moment. And I would argue that we're kind of in a place where representation is nowhere near enough, um, but that's where I was in my making as a young whippersnapper. So I decided to kind of take it all the way back to my archive. And I started mining my own um, images for my own family. And as a result of that, um, the fiction making kind of started to make itself. The story started to write itself. And so I would take these images that were sort of canonical. So this is my father and his first communion and me on my first communion. But I started taking myself out of the images and started from there thinking a little bit more rigorously around questions of identity, Caribbean identity, particularly Caribbean diasporic identity, um, blackness and anti-blackness in the Caribbean, all of these things just started kind of flooding the research and flooding the work. Um, and as a result, this series of paintings came about and this is a work called Baby Remember My Name. Um, and Baby Remember My Name is really important because out of it was born this character, Chucha Santa Maria, who becomes the first place where I start working with performance and sound and video. Um, Chucha is really important that she's someone else um, because she's meant to be a receptacle for all of these histories and histories of not just sort of the pleasures of this kind of image making, right? So the familial archive is essentially curated by the family itself. Um, but as it pertains to all of these questions around Caribbean identity, she also started to become a receptacle for colonial contamination and sort of the violent ills of um, colonization. And so it was really important that it wasn't me, Sofia Cordoba, but that it was somebody else, somebody that I could pour all of this into, but then also have a viewership that identifies with these stories, pour that into her as well. And what happened was that she was already so like so many of these um, performers that I'd been kind of looking at in this mode of representation, particularly around Caribbean diaspora, that the project became a music-based project. And this was the first time that I started making music seriously. Um, and as a funny aside, after this project was over, I was like, okay, well, I'm done working with music. That's great. But this album actually became kind of a favorite that summer among people that weren't particularly interested in art, but were interested in music. And so Chucha stopped being an alter ego and became this band that is me and my partner who were making this music all along. Um, and I mentioned that because all of the work you'll see from here on out is scored by us together. So we still make albums as like a separate entity and we make discrete experimental performance work, 
but then we also score all of the work um, that I'll be sharing with you today. So after I finished that work, I sort of felt like I had under my belt this sort of permission to be a performance artist. And up until that point, again, I'd been really a formal photographer working really within very strict parameters of that medium. And when I started the Chucha project, I felt this kind of wonderful discomfort at trying something I didn't know how to do. And for me, that kind of became a really important generative energy that I've carried on in my making. I really, I'm a jack of all trades because I really like not knowing what I'm doing sometimes. And so working with new media became a way to do that. I would say at this point, I've been doing performance and video for 12 years. So there's there's some knowledge, but um, at the time it became a very important energy. And so once I finished that project, I was thinking a lot about if that project had been specifically kind of about a very focused way of looking at Caribbean identity, how could I create a body of work that spoke to multiple marginalities and multiple identities that are themselves marginalized? And also how do I look beyond my own self? And that's when I started the Echoes of a Tumbling Throne or the Al Fin de los Tiempos series. Um, this series is a work that uh, employ science fictional tactics, um, not to think about apocalypse. I'm not particularly interested in disaster itself. I'm interested in what possibilities for liberation exist for black and brown, queer, colonized bodies on the other side of total collapse. So not looking at apocalypse or, or decay in this sort of negative way, I'm trying to look at it as a way of completely undoing to rebuild again. And this was an important project for me because it was the first time I started working with other performers. Um, so what you see here are stills from this video series. It's an episodic video series that went all the way to chapter eight. Um, chapter nine is sort of forever kind of hanging in limbo. Um, and again, this project was really singular and important for me because it was the first time that I was working with other folks. And I felt that if I was trying to create a vision of the future that encompassed and embodied many realities that were not the central focus of our contemporary moment, then the work needed to be built from that foundation. So working with other performers, people who were amateurs, people who were actors, people who were singers, all of this became part of the soup and it creates a kind of chaos in the making that um, became really, again, kind of a generative uh, source for where the work would go. Um, as I was making that work, it kind of became really quickly clear to me that what I what I, what work really wanted to be was a live performance. And so um, it took five years to kind of build it, but I was lucky enough to do the, um, the artist residency at the Mills Museum here in Oakland. Um, it's a wonderful museum and it's attached to a school that has this really incredible history, uh, both as an experimental music school and also as a dance school. So while I was embedded in that program, I started working with musicians from, their, from the conservatory and dancers from their dance school. Um, and what we did together was look at sort of the entirety of the Echo series, and then we reinterpreted the score um, and reinterpreted the movement together. So it was another way of inviting people into the work. Um, and sometimes things were kept faithfully to, you know, how I'd written them and how I'd scored the music. And sometimes they went completely to this other experimental, fully improvisational place, um, which is what I'm going to show you next. So this is a very brief excerpt that I'm going to show you. The piece was a total of um, 50 minutes and it was done at the Greek amphitheater in the back of Mills, which is sort of this weird secret, beautiful place that nobody uses, which felt apt for a kind of dystopic, utopic future. And um, yeah, what you'll see here is one minute of that. So keep that in mind, but it's meant to show these kind of more discrete pop moments kind of flowing into these more improvisational free jazz kind of uh, spaces. So hang on, we had this, ah, had this issue before. And the volume, okay, here we go. The pieces fell from heaven to day It's just another way to tell us it's angry Another trace from a racist space criminal What we did to our own kids this is one massive case of us as one body radiating in a heat tube to frost ardent waste tonight. We ain't into it. 
again, it's, you know, it's a quick, a quick going through it, but it gives you a sense of kind of the many moods that are evoked in it. Um, so as I was developing that piece, the Echoes work, um, it kind of dawned on me. And sometimes this is some, the way I work. I have this relationship with the work where the work is always kind of asking questions of me. And I had felt so desperate to work within that future timeline that I really catapulted that work like thousands of years into the future. And as I was developing it, this quiet little voice kind of asked, but how did we get there, you know? Um, and around the time that I'd been developing that work, I had this residency in Finland. And um, I, you know, I went out there with all of my gear ready to like create this super digital work like I'd been producing. And the landscape just was so present and so alive. It was the beginning of spring. Um, we can talk about this a little bit later, but it, the piece takes its name from this phenomena that happens when birds return to their migratory, uh, their mating grounds. Um, and so the landscape became a protagonist. It sort of forced itself into the work, and this series called Don Chorus was born out of it. I'm just going to play this in the background while I talk. Um, and the work then asked me to kind of expand what that landscape was. So this first one includes both the forest in Finland as it's, as it's thawing, and then the desert, kind of as these kind of dichotomous opposites, right, that we're sort of used to thinking about this way. And what this work was slowly trying to get at was a parable about how we ended in the place where all of these sort of half-naked bodies are existing in this, like, digitally corrupted world, you know? And so it's not direct in any way, but it's arguably more narrative than the work I'd been doing in the Echo series. Um, it follows this sort of cult... Um, of materialism and consumption and its its decay brings about this flood that ushers us into that other future. Um, there's a lot of kind of biblical intonation to that and that's by design. I work a lot with mythology and sort of the stories we tell ourselves. Um, and so a deluge didn't feel too over the top um, as the reason why we got there. Important piece in the sense that it starts to talk about climate change. So before I had it named the thing, and with this series, it became obvious that if there is a moment of rupture, the most likely scenario based on our contemporary moment again, is climate. So now climate is part of the work in a very significant way kind of going forward. Um, as I started developing that work, I was also um, going back and forth to my native Puerto Rico all the time. And I sort of decided that I wanted to localize one of the chapters in Puerto Rico. And so this work was really looking a lot at syncretic religion. So Santeria, Regla de Ocho, Yoruba, all of these important religions that were brought, essentially born out of the slave trade entering the Caribbean colonial world um, and existing as a way of creating subterfuge for these traditional Yoruba religions in a Catholic moment. And so for me, that sort of work also became another site of liberation. And this work is very infused with that kind of storytelling. What happens though, is as I'm creating this work, Hurricane Maria happens. And so this work, which is already, it's wanting to exist in a very fictional place actually gets sort of slapped with like actual climate apocalypse. So it has to kind of contend with that. Um, more than that, all of the things I'm trying to talk about in this work, right? So climate, um, the local debt that we have, our sort of situation under US empire, all of these things get brought to the surface by the event of the hurricane. And so the work still has this fantastical element, but as you see here in the subtitles, it becomes narrated by my family and their stories of what it was like before and after um, the hurricane. Um, quickly, the yellow is when my family is talking, and then white are um, subtitles for the songs that I use for this, which were all pulled from my Abuelo Cuco's collection, and they're all songs about storms. Um, so my work is incredibly layered, is what I'm getting at here, and it does that to create many points of, um, of access. That work eventually came to live in this installation, and so this is kind of where we jump to a different kind of making for me. Um, I've been working with sculpture throughout this whole point, but this is sort of a place where I feel like all of this became locked in with the with the media work in a way that it hadn't before. 
Um, so this installation was at Kate Warble Gallery in 2018. Um, and I had previous to this been working um, a little bit with taxidermy, thinking again about birds and the sort of idea of migration, mutation as well. So a lot of the, wor the birds I work with are what are called fantasy animals. So you'll see later they have colors that aren't natural, et cetera. But for this piece, I wanted to work with the absence of the bird. So all of these, as you can maybe see here, this is an empty nest. These are these little pewter legs. It's hard to see here, but absence is really becomes really important at this point. The front room, the ante room to that um, has this taxidermy piece sort of imposing in the middle and it kind of becomes this sort of harbinger of something. But I, something that I really like to strike with my work is this note of ambivalence. So things are neither positive nor negative. Um, there's just always kind of mystery in the air. Um, the work you see on the right there is a large panel. Um, it's photography on aluminum. So it's a, it's a collage that I built out in my studio by hand, re-photographed and then rebuilt digitally. And then we'll later see a version where there's painting intervention. Um, and then on the left there, you might see some familiar work. So that's Fruta Prieta and that's the series that um, I showed at the exhibition last year. And here it is in its sort of original kind of context. Um, Fruta Prieta is a series that really ties to that theme of syncretism and santeria and sort of mysticism and kind of symbol making. And these are all um, either found objects. Um, this is whale baleen. This is a stone that I painted to be a rock or, um, or objects that I make in the studio in clay. And then both are rephotographed um, large format. So again, the, they're, they're, black on black in this way that wants to kind of suck the light out, but they are in their in their making very, very high resolution. Um, this is a dope tick that wasn't at that show. Um, and these are all objects that came to me in this sort of meditative process. So I was creating these when I was up at the headlands and my process every day was sort of waking up and meditating. And it was kind of a lonely in a beautiful way kind of existence. And so I would have these sort of images kind of come into my head during that process. And I think it was just really linked to the material that I was working with. And so I started finding them or realizing them. Um, and that's what this, what the series comes from. Um, the name means black fruit. So again, the idea that syncretic, syncretic religion in the Caribbean is intricately and um, forever tied to blackness um, is really important uh, to this work and should not be overlooked. Um, and then I'm going to probably breeze through because I, I, I can ramble. Um, so I will go through this next work really quickly. But I also wanted to show kind of the flip side of that work was also me working with creating post-climate scenarios where um, human the human point perspective isn't prioritized. Um, and so I created this installation called The Gentle Voice That Talks To You Won't Talk Forever, um, which centered around this pink dove. Um, this pink dove was sort of the first work I did in taxidermy, which is why I wanted to show it, um, share it with you all. It now lives um, in the Susan Weller collection um, in New York, which I'm really happy for. Um, and this was how it was exhibited there. She had this really beautiful room that she um, painted pink. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about why I work with these materials and in, in, if that appeals in the questions. Um, but before I wrap all that stuff up, I also wanted to show that world map piece that I'd shown. This is, she she borrowed it for this exhibition, um, Susan did. And this is what it looks like once it's sort of intervened upon um, as a painting. So this is supposed to be a world map where there is, again, this theme of mutation and kind of the joining of things, um, the joining of lands and the kind of healing of the land happens in these ways that are um, rather extreme. Um, but again, kind of suggesting that mutation shouldn't be looked at as an aberration, but in fact, as a quick response to the environment. Um, and this is part of a kind of liberatory gospel, if you will, um, of the work. And to end on something completely different, um, this is the work that I am producing right now. We'll talk a little bit about what's in the studio, but I wanna give you all a break in the meantime. But um, last summer, um, right before I gave birth, I made this piece in my um, old studio. And this is a new work that is very, very new, as, as I just said. And it's a performance piece that asks the question of how and how and why and 
can it, um, revolution happen in the Americas, sort of in the contemporary context. So all of these characters are kind of coming with very specific voices from our zeitgeist, um, from ranging from YouTube to like political theory to Real Housewives. Um, and they all exist in this room and they're kind of negotiating um, all of their politics against each other in this break room. It's kind of like a dream space, but it's a break room. And then they are all they all exist in these sort of moments of dialogue. They don't speak to each other, but they speak to each other in these sort of yellow boxes where they're having, they're kind of monologuing and that monologue creates a conversation in the aggregate. Um, and that is that is a very quick, but not that quick probably, um, run through of, 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 of my media practice. Um, I think we should do Q and A. If you don't mind, we could do Q and A and then I can talk about the newer work and do a little, carrying the laptop around. Sure, that definitely works. Sophia, thank you. I feel like you packed so much information <laughs> in there. So maybe I'll kick it off with the first question so everyone can think, but then um, after that, folks are welcome to just unmute themselves and ask the questions themselves. Or if you wanna type it in chat, um, I'm happy to read questions that way. Um, but I have a question just in thinking about like some of the words that you were using kind of consistently throughout what you were sharing. I'm thinking about, you know, you have science fiction, revolution, liberation, mythology, identity, and kind of this connection of investigating kind of the real through the unreal and kind mm -hmm. of the, um, and I don't know, I just, I was thinking, hoping you could maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, uh, I, it's two, it's two things. So for one, I, when I made that leap from the very, again, very formal world of photography, it really happened because, and you know, when you go to grad school, your brain kind of gets cracked open in a number of ways. So there's that, but it also just was this very fundamental human dissatisfaction with making work that I thought would please sort of an art audience, but it wasn't actually satisfying anything in me. You know, and I think that when you're in the kind of very professional world of an MFA, there is very little room actually for you, the person. You're actually a, a, a body that makes work. And so it was actually quite a bit of an existential crisis to be, to be honest. And so once I started working in this way where I was using performance and video and installation and then allowing myself to, to dabble, if you will, with what materials, were more useful to the question, essentially becoming a conceptual artist. Um, that's when I felt aligned with what you're saying in the sense that those are my concerns as a person in the world. If I weren't an artist, liberation would still be like the primary fuel of my life, you know? Um, so that's part one. And then part two is that as I became more ensconced in a research that was, um, centered on science fiction. And I started reading Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin and Samuel R. Delaney, all of these incredible authors that are not straight white men um, and seeing what they were able to do with the genre. Then it became really clear to me that there's actually a whole world of work that is invested in these ideas of the dissolution of problematic and harmful systems um, that were kin to my work and kin to what I wanted to do. So it became this thing where the work, and this happens the more I sort of, I am exclusively an artist these days, is the work in my life no longer really have a separation. And, and it's very important for me that even though I really do strongly, it may not sound like it now, but even though I do strongly imbue the work with ambivalence, um, that for me in the making that the sort of political rigor of the work is aligned to my own sort of project as a person, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Does someone want to, else want to jump in with a question for Sophia? I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, Sophia, so from the Q&A that you submitted to me, you had mentioned during this shelter in place that you were drawing a lot and that you would go on a walk with your baby and you'd come across these images. What were some of the objects that you found and have you since created any art pieces from these from yeah. those? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good segue to look at the studio um, because yes, I, I will sort of briefly say that it became 
kind of a survival tactic because the early days were really shocking. Um, I mean, I weirdly feel like we're kind of going back there, but that's an aside. I just, you know, I was in New York doing a residency, all of these things just kind of completely closed on me. And so I was feeling really squeezed and I would go on these really long walks by the shoreline here and just kind of, it's similarly to how I made fruta prieta, I was sort of intuitively grabbing stuff, which as you can probably surmise from my presentation, I don't usually work intuitively. Um, so it kind of happened. And so I will show you a little bit what, this is very messy here, um, but I started just this, this is a very small collection of them. I've had to move them as the baby becomes more um, agile. Um, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of shells, a lot of broken things, um, a lot of stones, a lot of stuff that just felt honestly like discards. Um, and I don't usually maintain a drawing practice, but I started this series of drawings um, that became titled Brief Candle. Um, Brief Candle because it felt like the topic of, this is gonna get a little dark, but the topic of death was sort of always lingering um, and continues to linger. And something that happened that became kind of important as I was making this series um, and trying to again parent and survive and all of these things um, was that I continued all of my sort of work around climate um, but then the protests following the murder of George Floyd happened and the uprising happened and so for me it became the subject of death sort of doubled onto itself and so all of this text started to come in is that showing backwards for you guys I never know with zoom um, no it's straight okay um, okay, so it's backwards on my screen, but that I can deal with that later. Um, so this sort of subject of Black death and the spectacle of Black death started coming into the work um, in really significant ways. And so I started making, uh, you know, that happens, the research started to kind of all fold onto itself. And so I read Withering Heights and I was reading um, a brief history of seven killings. So all of this text around death um, and all of that kind of started to collapse with the objects. Um, and so these are two studies for two paintings that I'm gonna be making on um, linen soon. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's been, you know, and now there's like a, hu a huge cache of these. These are just the ones um, that I put up for the studio visit. But now I have this sort of huge cache of drawings, which are both a way for me to process all of this stuff and all of the heaviness of the year, mm -hmm. um, but also for me to kind of create this, for me, it feels like a catalog or a diary of this time um, in a way that I, again, I don't usually work with the moment. <laughs> I work mm -hmm. in a different timeline. Um, but yeah, that's been really gratifying. And again, it's it's compulsive in a way and I, I, can't, I can't stop. <laughs> oh, thank you. Of course. So anyone else or question for Sophia? Maybe some of the artists out there. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also fun, you know, these are always. Or maybe. Oh, I, I see Julia, I think. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. Um, I might have to leave quickly, but um, <laughs> I, sorry, I've had the good fortune to see you your work in many different formats over the years I've I I saw you you I think the first time I saw you guys perform as a band was at SOAX like Probably. seven seven years ago yeah, that was like our first live show I brought my mom to it and she still talks about it just so you know um <laughs> and I look forward to bringing Irving to one soon too but I oh, guess it just different. amazes me uh, just like the energy in the live music and the, the the band performances and the live the live performances how I'm sorry I'm not totally articulate but how you can to have the experience the the breadth of energies in your studio practice to feed off of like the live experiences the um, collaborative experiences and then the much more solitary practices and I 
you know, now we're kind of forced into a more solitary state, but I guess I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that spectrum in your practice. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think it's really good. I think that it suits the part of me that's always kind of searching um, to have kind of these different qualities of presence. Um, but something I will say about performing live um, as Chucha or with Chucha is that once it stopped being an alter ego, um, you know, we did that performance. We did a performance at City Hall that was commissioned by the city a few years ago. Um, I've done performances at the Internet Archive. All of these performances are in a way the most kind of honest performances of myself because I'm not wearing a costume. I'm not in an alter ego. Um, and so in a very funny way, this practice, which sort of came out of a response from folks that wanted more of that work, um, has forced me to, a, to a quality of performance that is very much vulnerable. Um, and that follows through with all of the, of the videos that accompany that project. Um, and I think that in a way, this last, the last work that I showed, the guillotina piece, is the beginning of me synthesizing that and synthesizing that kind of collaborator energy. So I think that as I've been doing this for a great many years, what's happening is, you know, I'm, I'm better at channeling um, how that energy is sort of used and, and sort of able to bring collaborators into it and feel that vulnerability in a smaller scale, right? So not like in front of a huge audience. Um, and so I think that it's always changing and always kind of responding um, to the moment or to the question that the work is asking. Um, but I do feel more and more, and I'm hoping this work shows that, I, I feel more and more like it's kind of becoming this, this singular stream and um, that feels really exciting. So Sophia, are you the performer, the choreographer? Are you everything? <laughs> Um, I work a lot with dancers because I feel like that's the final frontier. I feel like writing and movement are the things that I, I won't touch because only true geniuses do those things. Um, but I work a lot with dancers. And so the way that I give out instruction, and I work this way with music too, just not being musically trained, just self-taught, is that I work a lot with, uh, I give out instructions that are based on textures or a mood rather than being concrete. Um, if we're working, so again, I mentioned that piece that we did at City Hall, um, that was a piece on San Francisco being a sanctuary city. So I wanted this tiny body in this magnificent space to feel like they were really navigating the kind of hard structure of the state. Um, so what does that mean? You know, That doesn't mean anything concretely, but that gave enough to her so that when we started playing the music and we were kind of improvising back and forth on each other, this choreography emerges out of kind of the goalposts that the piece sets out. Um, so often the way I work is again, more abstractly in terms of my instruction. And then that work um, emerges usually again out of, out of collaboration. Mm, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. A question slash comment. Um, hi. We haven't really had a chance to talk ever. I know. We just met briefly a year ago, and it's so nice to have a chance to hear you talk about your work. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, so, one of my first impressions when I'm when I was listening to you and getting to see this the the breadth of the work and the the movement from the beginning into where you are now, I'm seeing this, you are going back and forth between um, dimensions and an exploration of space mm -hmm. and between um, constructing and deconstructing and then reconstructing. So I'm seeing these flat images, documentary sort of, um, reality, but yet still a constructed narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like you went back to the basic of painting and re-examined what you were seeing. Um, it's like you took it apart with paint. And then the next thing was building these 
constructed realities um, within the you know performance and spaces, and it's like you were you building up the form. So I'm I'm I love this back and forth mm -hmm. um, and this tension between all of that. And I hope that I'm making sense, but um, I would love for you to talk about that a little <laughs> bit more if that makes sense at all. Yeah. It does in a, it does in this way. So bear with me, but I think this will make sense right back. Um, so I think the moment that I started working with this idea of not sci-fi, right, but sort of speculative modalities, right? Multiple timelines coexisting or existing, the work existing in the future and me, the maker existing in the past, all of these timelines kind of concurrently happening was originally a very neat narrative device for me, right? So I was able to tell these stories because all of these timelines were happening over there. What's happened over time, and this is where I really am indebted to literature and the artists that I sort of spend time with, um, is that I stopped using speculation as a narrative device and it became a formal device. So what that means is, to me, is that it stopped being a way of telling a story and it started being a way of making. And so I think that something that you that you just said and, and sort of hits it on the head is this idea of unmaking and rebuilding, right? So I'm, like I said, I'm not interested in destruction for destruction's sake. I'm interested in what happens when, when we sort of clear the decks, what are the possibilities when we restructure everything? And I don't say this to, advocate for that as a solution to our problems. I say that as an invitation to involve ourselves in sort of radical imagination, whatever that means to everyone individually, right? Um, for me, it's an important part of my politic, but it it's an important part of my making just the same. And so when I'm working materially across all of this media, um, I'm engaging in a sense in this kind of act of time travel or dimensional kind of shift. And it's not this sort of hokey storytelling thing, but it's actually a way for me to have the practice in its very matter and its very form really be responding to the kind of thinking that I wanna see in the world, which is about, you know, again, thinking completely outside of the ways that we're used to about the problems that face us, right? So climate being a really important one, we are, our species has this impossible, task ahead of us and yet we can't seem to do anything about it because it's really hard for us to <laughs> see it for us to imagine it that's my dog okay. um, <laughs> keeping the studio safe um and so it's again it's a way for me and it sort of happened right it sort of happened because of working this way for a long time that as i get into these tactics that are more documentary right so the don chorus series which is sort of the work that i'm wrapping up now or the new performance piece that i'm doing they're not they're not particularly fantastical in their aesthetic. They're actually quite oh. grounded. Cleo, thank you. Um, they're quite grounded in the document, in the documentary, and in, in showing sort of the truth of our moment, um, oh. but then complicating that by throwing it completely oh. into this other timeline. Hey, Cleo, come here, come here. Um, and in that way, I do feel like hopefully what it starts to do is create another, a, a form of layering that isn't just in what's in front of you, but it's a layering that actually hopefully transgresses the space where the art, the viewer is sort of encountering the work. I hope that made sense. Yeah, yeah. And are you interested in parafiction? Are you looking at that at all? I don't, what does that mean? I don't know. It's like, it's, you're sort of describing it and I, I'm not gonna be able to sit here and explain it in a brief amount of time, but I could send you some things. Yeah. <laughs> um, something that I learned about in graduate school and it's this like, it's, it's the truth, but you're, but it's not the truth. Hmm. It's this like a fictionalized truth, I guess you could say. And it's a way of like, reinterpreting reality and yeah I should I mean I feel like that's kind of what you're describing to anyway yeah please stop, stop my way because I am I am very sort of invested in that mode of sort of making and I feel like the way the work is going is it's sort of not really 
always wanting to exist within the sort of like very specific kind of sci-fi aesthetic. It's far more concerned with, again, talking about the contemporary moment in this very concrete way. And I feel like that. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Sophia, I want to throw one more question in there, and then I think we'll probably throw it back to Robin, who wanted to introduce um, Eileen. But um, I'm curious, because you talk a lot about, you know, climate change and um, Caribbean identity and kind of Blackness, anti-Blackness, and, um, you know, you speak very passionately about these really kind of activist topics but then at the same time you were also you know stating multiple times that like your work it, is very ambivalent um, in its presentation and I'm trying to like kind of balance those two and I was hoping you might just talk a little more about that yeah um you know that was a hard road to walk because I feel like one thing I knew really early on when I started making work that was specifically sort of investigating Caribbean identity, right? So before it kind of sprung into this larger world of questioning was that I didn't want to be an art slash activist. I felt like for me, I had a friend recently beautifully describe it as there are different kinds of medicine. And I believe in activism, but that's different. That's a different space for me entirely. Um, and a different way to engage with political systems and systems in general. Um, my work stems from my concerns, um, particularly again about around the bodies of marginalized bodies. Um, but I don't. I'm very I'm very sort of cautious um, about sort of in the entanglement of the two. Um, and I'm totally losing my thread. Can you repeat the second part of your question? Because I actually had a really good answer for you. Yeah, I mean, it was thinking about how you were mentioning ambivalence. And so in some sense, you're taking on, you know, these topics related to activism, but then also presenting them with ambivalence. Yes, I will blame the dog for distracting me. Um, no, the reason then that idea of ambivalence becomes really important to the work, um, it has a lot to do with the way why I collaborate as well is because I do feel like if I'm trying to create a future or envision a future that is so radically different from ours, um, then it cannot be, I can't be the director of that future. I can't be the sole writer of that future. Um, if I wanna live in a plural future, then that future needs to be built thus. And so for me, it's not about, I mean, you know, practically when I'm bringing people into a studio, into a space to work together, I am the director, right? But I really imbue the work and the narratives in it and, the, and that stems from set design to songwriting um, with the possibility that things can go either way at any point or more than either way. There's always like 50 avenues that, that things could go. Um, and that's for me a really important site to consider that this should be horizontal, um, that all of our voices are important in the building of this future. Um, rather than me saying, okay, here's how it's going to go. This is what's going to happen. The, er the collapse will be this way. And then we're going to restructure this way. For me, that's no different than the thinking that has gotten us into all the ills that I'm particularly concerned with. So creating a lot of ambivalence is really important. The final part of that is that as I'm steeped in research around climate, there's a very real possibility that our species won't make it. Um, and that's a tragic truth, but I think that that pathos needs to be in the work as well, um, because I am actively trying to create a space for imagining solutions. Not that, that, not that the work is doing that, and that is the role of activism, and that is the role of policy, um, but I'm trying to create the space for radical imagination by sort of showing multiple radical imaginations and radical imaginaries existing at the same time. Um, and again, that's why the work is always imbued with mystery, even though, yes, behind the scenes, I have a, a very clear plan. Just kidding, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sophia, for sharing your work. Um, and we're so excited to hear about it. And I will pass it back over to Robin. Is Eileen on? Is she here? Okay, um, so I want to introduce Eileen Gutman. She's our Deputy Director of NIMWA and introduce to Sophia. 
And Eileen, I was hoping maybe you could just give us a brief glimpse on the Woman to Watch 2023 theme. Oh my, well. <laughs> I mean, one sentence, the thematic approach. <laughs> right, well, uh, actually, I think Sophia touches on a lot of the uh, subject matter that and the thought that um, our curators are pu pulling together and they are currently working on the guidelines. And so we hope to deliver those finally um, in a few weeks, we'll see. Um, but I particularly loved when Sophia uh, articulated that speculation became a way of making a story, not just telling a story. And I really felt like that said it all. And Sophia, I love seeing your work. That was a real treat for me because I hadn't so much. It before. And I do wanna say that we are so grateful to Claudia Schmuckley for identifying you and nominating you as one of the Women to Watch artists for Paper Roots. Um, and I hope that I get to meet you in person one day. And I wanna thank the committee again. Um, but I'm not trying to be evasive. I promise you, we, we are going to come back and have a separate meeting with all of you to um, go through these guidelines and, and really talk about um, I guess it's uh, the the new the future as artists see it. So thank you, Eileen. Thank you, and thanks everyone for attending this Zoom call. Um, as Jamie mentioned, this will be recorded, and then I figured out how to upload the video link into YouTube, and then I'll email it to all of you, and then post it on our Facebook page. Um, we hope to see all of you on our next and last Zoom call for 2020. Wow, what a year. <laughs> and that Zoom call will be with Lava Thomas on Thursday, December 10th at 3.30 Pacific Standard Time. And so until then, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. A lot of work, Robin. Thank you, Robin and Jamie, for all you've done and Eileen for being here. And I just can't reiterate enough um, and echo or ditto what Eileen said, that we are so fortunate to have Sophia and Julia and Catherine and Lava and um, Amy and all of our wonderful artists that have been associated with Women to Watch. It's enriched our lives and we've learned so much from you. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. No, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Stay well. Yes. Thank you, thank you again, Sophia. So nice meeting you. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, everyone. Okay, take Bye. care. Next month, Lava. Bye. 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 Thank you, Bye. everybody. So nice seeing you all. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye